I think what I'll do is start with a little story. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, 1761 in England, William Carey was born. Now, William Carey, I got to tell you a little bit about the time and, and where he was in history. You see, in Western Europe, in the quote-unquote Christian world, Western Europe, America, it was dominated at that time with this idea that if God wants to reach the lost, if he wants to reach pagan people, you know, the savages, well, God will take care of that. That's not our problem. That's God's problem. Who do you think you are thinking you need to help God? You see, that was their excuse, but the truth of the matter is, is there were some big companies, the East India Company and others, that were controlling trade coming out of India, Indonesia, uh, North Africa, in, in Canada, Northern Canada, places like that. And they did not want people who were natives of the country to become Christians because it would cost money. They would lose money in terms of trade. So they were, they were pushing this idea that God, well, God doesn't really care about the heathen. They're going to hell, let them go. It's not our problem. But William Carey went, that's not biblical. I don't see that in God's word. And he became convinced that his job was to love the lost and do something about this. But he had exactly zero backing. Nobody would back him up. He also didn't have an education. So he had absolutely everything against him that could be against him. But he said, I believe this is what God wants me to do and I'm going to go do it. And he managed to, you know, get passage to go to India. His wife did not want to go. But he said, honey, I've got to go. So I'm going. You're either coming with me or you're staying here in England. But one way or another, this is what's going to happen. Because I serve the Lord first. The day he was leaving and getting on the ship, she finally decided to show up. As they went to India and he got there, he found that the East India Trading Company was brutal. He found out also that in India, Hinduism was a lot more brutal a religion than he realized. You see, because in Hinduism, even today, because Hinduism has been around for a long time, the idea of Hinduism is, is that you're going to be reincarnated into different forms over and over and over and over and over again. And in order, this is their idea, in order for you to be reincarnated into something much cooler than where you are today, so if you don't want to come back as a worm or a mosquito or something else, you know, like that, if you want to come back bigger and better, well, you got to build up good credit. They call it karma. You know, the more good karma you build up, the better, the more likely you are to, uh, you, know, you know, come back something better. Well, how do you build up good karma? Well, what they did is, they would devote themselves to one or more of 300 million different possible gods. Pick one. You know, and if you devote yourself to this God enough, maybe the God will be impressed with you enough to help you out with this whole karma business. That's their idea. So these people still to this day, but back then as well, what they would do is they would do in almost in insane things to show their dedication to the God, to try to impress the God. Some of these people would starve themselves literally to death to prove their devotion to this God. Some people would stare at the sun until they went blind. Some of them would mutilate the body in ways that I can't even describe in mixed company to prove their devotion to a God. Some of them would literally stand on one foot for 30 years, day and night, in order to prove and hope that their God would be impressed with them enough. And some, in fact many in William Carey's day, would take newborn children and drown them in the holy Ganges River, hoping to impress the gods. And there was a practice at that time where when somebody died, they would cremate the body. But in order to help the cremated guy to get, you know, some extra karma, they would take his wives and throw them alive on the burning pyre and burn them up too. 
now it's going to help this situation out here. This was what William Carey faced when he got to India. Blinding poverty, people dying of starvation in the streets and devoting themselves to the pagan gods. And, and just, he, the things that he saw just blew his mind. But he felt a love for these people so intense that he taught himself six languages. He labored for the first seven full years before even one person became a convert. Seven years. During that time, his wife went insane. And when I say insane, she tried to kill him, so they had to chain her in a room because she was frothing at the mouth, mouth crazy. Then one of his children died. Then he carried on. He carried on like this for 40 years until not only his first wife died, but his second wife died. Three of his children died. He went through people um, rioting against him, trying to kill him. For 40 years, he continued. He pressed on until at the end of his life, he had translated the Bible into 34 Indian languages. Not only did he do that, but he installed and trained 30 different missionaries, 40 different um, uh, Indian missionaries that he sent out planting churches, 45 different mission stations in the country, and a church that started with one convert into 600 converts. Now, you got to understand, this is the early 19th century, the 1800s, and so a 600-person church is a mega church in a pagan country. His efforts changed the entire country because as they developed, it was because of William Carey that they, they made it illegal to do the, you know, drown your children in the Ganges River and burn your wives, you know, at the end. Those things are now illegal in India because of him. His efforts literally changed India. But more than that, because of his story, he started a missionary movement that continues to this day. The reason that we are sending out missionaries next week, we are giving them their commissioning ceremony. Why do we send out missionaries? Where does that idea come from? Him. He's the one that started the modern missionary movement as we know it. So we can honestly look at one man and his faithfulness and his utter commitment to God has inspired literally tens of thousands of missionaries and millions of people are going to heaven because of his faithfulness. Now that's a man of God. Now that's a man who understands what it means to be sold out and dedicated to God. You understand what I'm talking about? Now, we've been studying the book of Exodus. We've been going through it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's what we do here for the most part. And... In chapter 19, we see that God, after he brought them out of the land of uh, Egypt, after he brought the Hebrew people through the desert, he's doing all this stuff, he brings them to a point of decision. Now, this is really important. He's shown them all of these miracles. He's demonstrated who he is to these people, but he brings them to a point of decision. And every human being has that same thing happen. Every human being has the proofs of who God is displayed to them in one way or another. And there will be a point of decision in your life. It's the same kind of a thing. So he brings them up to the edge of this mountain, Mount Sinai, a secluded mountain. And he does that so that he can reveal to them, listen to me now, he's going to reveal to them a way to live out what it means to be sold out and dedicated to God. He's going to give them a way to do that. Now, it's, it's really important that you understand that preliminary so that you can get what's going on here. Take a look at where we are. We're starting Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Now, just so you know, to give you a heads up, Exodus chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. So let's take a look. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. 
Now, the, the first thing that I want to remind us of is that these are not just words that you read on a page. Okay? The, this is God speaking in an audible voice. This is not God speaking through a prophet. This is not God speaking through, you know, kind of a leading in your heart. This is not just a consensus of opinion from leadership. This is God himself. All of 19, chapter 19, was telling us that, that God was, was displaying his power. I, he was literally melting a mountain right in front of them. You know, they, they were terrified. They heard these huge thunderous sound we talked about this a couple weeks ago and and then God literally speaks these words so if God is literally speaking these words with a voice like thunder these are not the 10 suggestions <laughs> it's not the 10 suggestions now when God is speaking like this 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 is something rather intense they heard the voice of God audibly. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Now, what's important about that is we're talking about the God. We talked about last Sunday, Easter Sunday, and, and the week before that. We talked about the evidence for who God is. I use evidence because God uses evidence. He's using it right here. He's saying, look, guys, I'm the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt. How did I do that? I did it with incredible miracles. I caused the whole river to turn into blood and the frogs and the lice and the, and the hailstorms and all of those things. It was me. I did miracles that only I can do to demonstrate to you who I am. That's what he's saying. Look at the evidence. I am the Lord. That, that, he, he's saying the same thing. And listen to me. He's saying this in a way that is meaningful to them. Do you see that? I brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is personal. I brought you out. You've seen the evidence in your life because you saw the miracles in Egypt. That's what's relevant to you. Does that make sense? In the same way, God has used evidence down through history in a way that is relevant to whichever culture or whichever time period he was in. You had the same lesson last Sunday. I went through things that are relevant to us in the 21st century. What is the first and second laws of thermodynamics? What is the, the law of causality? The expansion of the universe? All these types of things. Because it's, it's God saying, I am the Lord God who brought everything into existence out of nothing and I am the one who did these things and proved it to you, so pay attention. That's what he said to them. That's what he's saying to you. But he's also saying here that that evidence reminds them that not only has God proven himself, but he has proven through these miracles and through all of this stuff that he has the right to rule their lives. You see, you owe your existence to God. We talked about that last week, the law of causality. They saw the same thing. Yeah, we owe our existence as a people to him. He has the right to rule your life. But... Exodus 19 teaches us a very powerful truth. Even with all of that proof of God's right to rule, he still gave them a free choice on whether or not they would accept his right to rule. In other words, God has the right to rule, but he's given you the power on whether or not you'll accept that. Let me say that again. God has the right to rule. He's proven it. But he gives, you, he gives you the power to decide whether or not you're going to accept it. So that's what he said to them in chapter 19. He said, look, I've proven it, but now I'm going to make you an offer. I will be your God and you will be my people. If you accept this deal, I'm going to bless the socks off of you. What do you want to do? That's what he said. 
And in Exodus 19, verse 8, they all said, yes, we'll do it. And Moses marches right up to the mountain and says, they accept the deal, boss. That's what's going on here. And so God is saying, look, now that you've accepted the deal, and I'm going to be your God because I have the right to be, here's how we're going to do this. Does that make sense? That's what's going on in chapter 20. Now, it's this, this is important to understand all these distinctions because how many of you know that God still has the right to rule every human life? I don't care who you are, where you are, what language you speak, you know, what, what culture you come from. You know, it doesn't make any difference. God has the right to rule your life. Why? Because you didn't ask to be born. You didn't ask to be born. The, the, the fact that you exist at all is because God has allowed it. It was God that called the universe into existence. It was God that designed Adam's DNA and Eve's DNA. And because of that, you and I have DNA that says human on it. God made us. And because of that, he has the right to rule. But things, nothing's changed. God still gives us the right, or the power, I should say, not the right, the power on whether or not we're going to accept his right. Why is that? Well, we talked last week because... Real love cannot be coerced. It has to be free or it's not real. And here's what God is saying now. Now that we've gotten past all that, I've shown you who I am. I've given you the opportunity to freely accept me. You said yes. So if you do accept me, you're accepting me and my right to rule and you're going to accept it on my terms. Here's term number one in chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You're going to accept this deal? Fine. There are no other gods in your life. When he says there's no other gods before me, it's a Hebrew phrase that means in my sight. So what he's saying is, is that when God looks at your life, there is nothing around you that competes with him. He is your all in all. That's what he's, there's no other gods before him. That's what, he, what he's saying. So your devotion, your loyalty, it's got to be 100%. Now, God cannot be one of many gods in your life. Can't be one of many devotions in your life. Now, before we continue, there are some people, okay, many people, that they love to argue theological points and they really, they really like to get into this. They, um, they say things like this. You know, Pat, uh, we're, we're not under the law of Moses. You understand that, right? Yes, I, I do. I, I understand that. I took some theology classes. I do know that. Okay. We're not under the law of Moses, meaning that Jesus completed the law of Moses. Yes, that's true. That's why we don't have to worry. That's why we get to eat bacon. Somebody say, yeah. Okay, that's fine, all right? And they say, yeah, so since we're not under the law anymore, number one, why are you studying that? That's all dead. We should be New Testament people. We shouldn't be studying this Old Testament stuff anyway. And secondly, you know, you, you can't, you know, you, you can't be worried about all those laws anymore. And you know one of the key reasons that people say that is because the Ten Commandments is only the introduction to the law, okay? There's a lot more than the 10. How many of you knew that? Okay, the top, the top 10 just takes us into the rest of the rules. And when you look at that, I mean, there's all kinds of rules. There's rules about, you know, what kind of thread that you can wear. You can't have two different kinds. What kind of seed you can put in your field. There's, there's purity rules. There's all kinds of rules. And they say, see, we, we don't keep any of that stuff anymore. We're not under the law. You're wasting your time. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Ho hold your horses here for a second. So you're saying that since we're not under the law, we don't have to worry about the law anymore. But doesn't the law say you should not commit murder? So if the law says that, and we're not under the law, so we can murder now, right? Yes or no? But we're not under the law. You see, it says in the law, you shall not commit adultery. <laughs> well, I guess we're okay. We can do whatever we like, right? Because we're not under the law. Somebody say, no. So there's something missing here. 
See, people, they want to pick and choose. They don't like things that are in the law, so they say we're not in the law. You know one of the key reasons I say that? Because there's a tithing law. They don't like that part. You're supposed to give one-tenth of your income to the work of God. And the, you'll hear preachers preaching that we need to be doing this, and that you got people out there, and I've heard them because they've written me plenty of emails. When I mention tithing, they go, we're not under the law anymore. And I, 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 I have not done this, but I so badly want to write back. And so you're saying that murder and adultery and everything else is okay because we're not under the law? You can't pick and choose from this, friends. You can't. So, so what's going on here? If we're not under the law, why is it still wrong to commit murder? If we're not under the law, why is adultery still wrong? Here's why. And I want to explain this to you because Jesus explained it. He said it this way. He said, look, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit murder. But I'm saying something new to you because I'm the lawgiver in the first place. I'm saying you can't even look at somebody with hatred in your heart or you've already murdered them in your heart. I'm taking that law to a whole new level. I'm not abolishing the law. I'm completing it and giving you a whole new one. And it's based on the same principles. In fact, the original law of Moses, now this is important, the original law of Moses was intended to simply give the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, a way to live out the law that's already written on their hearts. That same law is still on your heart. It's called the conscience. Now let me tell you, what this means, because people go, I don't get it. How is this law on our hearts? I don't get it. Well, I'll give you an example. Murder. Everybody, every human culture has rules against murder. Now, the cultures may differ on what is murder and what's not. Cultures may differ on whether or not I can kill you on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, Okay, but there's still a rule. There's still something intuitive. All human cultures know in their heart that the unlawful killing of a human being, there's something about it. We're not animals. You feel it. You know it. And it's in every culture, even pagan cultures. I mean, even in the worst of cultures, even Roman culture, Romans were excellent. They were, they were experts at killing people and they still had laws against murder. And you think, how does that work? I mean, these guys are into gladiators and they still think that murder is wrong because it's in their heart. Adultery is the same thing. I mean, we, we, we have, you know, there's this idea that adultery is, you know, the prohibition against adultery is just a biblical thing. No, it's universal in human culture. Now, cultures may differ on whether or not you can have one wife or a dozen wives, okay? They may differ on whether or not this is really adultery or that is really adultery, but every human culture has it. Why? Because it's written on the heart all the way from Adam, Adam, Eve. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's there. Now, the cultures have twisted and done and this, and they've got all kinds of different rules, but it's still the same concept. The, if the laws that we see here that are being written out are simply reflections of the principles that are already in your heart. And that's why Jesus said, look, this stuff, it transcends. It goes beyond just the way Moses wrote it out. Moses wrote out a way to live this out for the Jewish people. I'm giving you a new way because we're going to start incorporating the Gentiles from all kinds of different cultures and we're going to have to take this to another level. But the principles, we've got to get underneath and find the principles because they're the same. And people look at me and go, well, what about all those purity laws? You know, you, know, you can't eat this and you can't eat that and you've got to wash your hands and this, that, and the other. And I'm going, look, it's the same thing. There is something written in your heart about what is gross and what isn't. And we all know it. I mean, think about it. We're not animals. We're not animals. Now, we all have a sense. Every culture has a sense of this is clean and that is unclean. Now, it can differ. I mean, there are some cultures that they will eat things that you and I will go, oh, okay, and you, you take an egg, you know, and bury it in the ground for like six weeks and you eat it. Okay, and you and I, and they look at us and go, you eat pork. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we both have a sense of what is, do it with me. 
Okay, we all have that. Why? Because God has written in our hearts, there's clean and unclean. You are not an animal. Animals, I mean, my dog barfs, turns around and goes, ooh, bunch. And I go, whoa. I mean, have you ever done that? Have you seen that? Hey, Melissa, the dog's eating the, you know, the barf again. Can you fix it? Okay. <laughs> okay. Why? See, animals have no sense of this. In fact, the smellier, the stinkier, and the dirtier, the better. But human beings have written in their hearts, this is clean, that is unclean. Now, God simply wrote it out for that particular people in that particular time, but it's in your heart. Do you see this? The law is much deeper than just a bunch of rules. It's a reflection of what's already here. For example, this first law. Um, the first law is very clear. You shall have no other gods before me. That's pretty clear. Why? Because within all human beings everywhere written on their heart is the need to worship God. It's there. That's why they worship almost everything else because there's this principle in us that says, I got to worship, I got to worship, I got to worship. And because of that, even atheists who say, well, there is no God, I don't worship anything. You're worshiping yourself, pal. Everybody, everybody does. And then God is saying, based on that principle, I want you to get it clear. You need to worship the God that has proven himself to be the one and only true God and nothing else. That's what you need to get in your head. So the principle is, you got it in you, you need to act on it. Now, this was a radical idea at the time. Because at the time, they, they'd just been in Egypt for hundreds of years, hadn't they? There's dozens of gods in Egypt. They had their own little temples, and they got their idols, and they got all this stuff. So these people had seen all kinds of different gods. And they're familiar with the ancient concepts. Because back then... The, you know, and even today, the lying teachers of the false gods, they use the power of fear to control people. Here's how it works. You know, you could never tell if the devotion I'm giving to one God is not going to offend some other God, right? And because you're never, you could never tell, you could never tell if, um, well, the sacrifice I'm making to serve you might not upset you. And so I got to make the priest happy. And so I got to get more sacrifice and more sacrifice and more sacrifice in order to, in order to, the fear, 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 fear. And they were used to that. And God is saying, let all of that go. I have proven who I am. Worship me and me alone. Don't worry about the false gods and all that fear. There's a lot of pressure on you. I know. Give it up. Worship me. Now, that sounds good, and you and I, we look at it and go, well, we don't live in India. We don't live, you know, in places where we have to worry about them worshiping all these other gods. First of all, don't be so quick to assume that. There's half a dozen Hindu temples right here in this city. There's a Buddhist one right here in Surprise. Okay, so because of that, you know, it's not that far from you. But furthermore, you've got to understand, it's the same kind of thing today. How many of you know that there are dozens and dozens of different voices out there in this culture that are going to condemn you for saying this is right and that is wrong? What you're doing is you're saying this God is right and that God is wrong. Well, what if you offend that God who says this is right and that is wrong? We do it all the time. Well, this, is, this lifestyle is right and, and that lifestyle is wrong. And then hater, bigot, you know, all this sort of thing because you say, I'll just use the sex God as one. You've got this God in our culture that says, all forms of sexual, uh, you know, whatever we want to do, that's okay. Well, except for sex with children. We'll draw the line there. Well, wait a minute. If everything is okay, why are you drawing the line on sex with children? That's just arbitrary. And did you realize that as soon as you accept that God as true, you just offended the other God? And believe me, because I've been to Holland. I was a short-term missionary there. And in the city of Amsterdam, it is perfectly legal to have sex with children down to the age of 12. Nobody's going to say a word. Oh, yeah. You see, and you're going to offend all those people that say, well, that's perfectly acceptable if you accept this and draw the line there. See, it's the same thing. If I, if I serve this God, I might offend that one. 
And if I, well, what about this? And, and the fear, the fear of being labeled this and labeled that. And the one true God says, look at the evidence of who I am and just ignore the false gods. Worship me and me alone. Do you see it? Nothing's changed. Every, you, you were in the same boat as the Hebrews. You were in the same boat as the Hebrews. Look at verse 4. He says, You shall not make for yourself an idol of any likeness, or, or any likeness, I should say, of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. That's what he's saying here. Now, that seems pretty easy for us to grasp. We're not supposed to make this image and bow down to it, but I, I, we, we don't quite understand what he means there. He's, first of all, I want you to be, understand, he is not saying you can't paint a picture or make a sculpture or you know, do photography or anything like that. He's not saying that, and the reason we know that is because in this very same book, you're going to see them build a tabernacle and an ark, and on the ark, you're going to see two cherubim. Those are images. But you see, they didn't worship the images. So there's nothing wrong with the image itself. Does that make sense? So you get some people, they get all freaked out, and now you can't have pictures in your house or anything because of this. He's not saying that. He's saying there's a principle here. God is spiritual, not material. And that means that there is no material thing that could ever actually represent him. So don't make one up, not even in your mind. This is what he's trying to say. Then the idea of don't bow down to an image or an idol or in any material thing is what he's saying here. Why is that? When they worship an idol, what they're doing when they bow down is they are saying to the idol, I owe my existence to you. That's what they're saying. They're saying, I owe you know, my devotion to you. You are the one that's going to give me what I need if I give you devotion. Make sense? That's what they're doing. And God is saying, you don't do that to anyone or anything except me. Now, that's why idolatry is bigger than just an image. Because you can bow down to things and say, I owe my existence to you. Let me give you one example. Nature. This is the big thing. It's in the news. It's everywhere. We've got you know, worries about global warming and worries about environmentalism, and worries and worries and worries. Why? Because our entire culture is wrapped around this concept that this is what you owe your existence to. You see, because we all know that scientifically it's goo to you. Just wait for a million years or so, right? There's this belief that out there that we owe our existence to Mother Nature. Now, that's beautiful. And, you know, that is close to heaven because it's in Canada. <laughs> British Columbia, in fact. <laughs> Just so you know. But anyway... The idea is, is that people will bow down to naturalism or environmentalism or Mother Earth because they believe that, you know, since we're just the process of this long evolutionary thing, we owe our existence to nature. We owe our devotion to nature. Nature will give us everything that we need. Do you see this? It's an idol. It's an idol. No. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the thought that we should protect the environment. In fact, the Bible tells us that the God who made this said, you human beings need to manage this. You need to be good stewards with this. You need to, you need to take care of this. And this should not be what you worship. But you should look at this and go, wow, God, you make cool stuff. And give him the glory for that. That's what you do. There's nothing wrong with wanting to protect the environment or hiking or, or, or loving mountains and trees and, or anything like that. It's just what are you setting your heart on? Did you know that, that people today, they even look to nature as 
securing them in the afterlife. It's true. They've got whole cemeteries now where you can get buried with a tree, uh, tree um, uh, nut or seed and it'll grow. You'll become the tree. It'll, it'll secure you in the afterlife. Circle of life. This is just nature worship. Nothing has changed. It's just nature worship. And God is saying, here we go in verse 5, you shall not worship them. You shall not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. You shall not worship them. Now, I'm about to explain two things to you that get people hung up in our American culture today. The first is it says, I am a jealous God. Now, people get hung up on that, don't they? You know, a lot, of, a lot of Christians, they don't want to read this stuff because this doesn't look very good for God. How many of you have ever heard this? There's a difference between the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is no difference, okay? There is no difference. But they say that because they say, well, you know, the Old Testament, jealous God. And we all know what jealousy is. I mean, jealousy is vengeful and petty and self-absorbed and, and, you know, all that sort of thing. Well, the problem is, that how many of you know that languages can change over time? You see, once upon a time, this wasn't written in English. You, did you know that? It was originally written in Paleo-Hebrew. Okay, that's really old Hebrew. Okay, it was actually, the words were probably written in Egyptian hieroglyphs. I mean, remember where, where uh, or maybe Akkadian glyphs, but one way or another, I mean, it was written by Moses a long time ago in Paleo-Hebrew, and that's going to change over time. And the, the King James Version published in 1611 was translated from Latin. So when, when, now in 1611, now Shakespeare, you know, was, uh, when did he die? Somewhere in the late 1500s, right? 1590s, somebody tell me. Somebody was an English major around here. 16 something? I don't know, right in, the, right in that neighborhood. Okay, something like that. Okay, so that was a long time ago. And back then, if you read like Shakespeare's play, the word nice, well, what did that mean in the 1500s, 1600s? It meant silly, stupid, foolish. We use the word nice to say, nice to meet you. Okay, that was saying something completely different 500 years ago. (laughs) Completely different. Okay, so languages change. And in the same way, when this was translated from Latin into English, the word jealous was used, and that has been kept ever since, even though the word jealous has a different meaning in the 21st century than it did in the 1500s. Now, here's what it means in Hebrew. The word jealous is kana in Hebrew. Now, in Hebrew, it's got a definition that long, half a paragraph long. I didn't want to put it all up here, so I'm going to give you the, 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 the gist of it. It gives the sense of a zealous or an intense desire for the best to come to a loved one, to a loved person. That's what jealous means in this context. So he's, it, it's like me with my kids. I want the best for them. Why? Because they're the best kids on the planet. They are also the best looking. I have checked. My five children are the best looking, the smartest. They're even the best smelling kids. I want the best for them. That's what this word jealous means. I'm a dad. I want the best because I love them fiercely. How many of you know that God is perfect love and he loves you fiercely? And because of that, he wants the best and anything less than a relationship with him, anything that competes with that relationship with him, he doesn't want that in your life because that's shortchanging you. He doesn't want to shortchange you. So he's jealous for you, not jealous of you. Does that make sense? And so that's a completely different way of looking at this word. Hopefully that clears it up for you. But it also says, I'm a jealous God, but I visit the iniquity of people down to the second, third, fourth generation of those who hate me. And people look at that visiting iniquity. First of all, we don't understand, again, the word visiting. 
and we don't understand the word iniquity. And because we don't really understand either one of these words, we assume that it means that God punishes your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren for what you do. That's what it looks like in English. And you think, well, I don't want want to serve that petty, jealous, mean God that just, you know, takes my sins and and visits them down on my kill. What kind of a God is that? You're missing it. You got the jealous part now. Let's explain visiting iniquity. First of all, the word iniquity is going to tell you that iniquity means badness, unsoundness. It means more than sin. It's not just sin. Iniquity is a lot like rot. If you get an apple and it rots and you put it with a bunch of other apples, what happens? It contaminates all the other apples. It's a, that's what iniquity is. Now, the word visiting in Hebrew, it's actually two words here on, um, actually three words. It's a phrase in, vi- in terms of visiting iniquity. And again, it, w- it would take me this much of a definition from the Hebrew dictionary to get you to see it. So I'm just going to kind of give you the sense of it. The word visiting, what it means is the sense of to allow for. To allow for. In other words... People who hate God, people who refuse to do things God's way, that lifestyle is like rot, like rot in an apple. And all the other apples that are around it are going to get contaminated by that rot. And I, as the living God, am not going to prevent that. In other words, what God is saying is I'm going to let you feel the consequences of your bad actions. That's what he's saying. How many of you know God could prevent all evil. But this scripture is telling us, no, in order to allow free will, I'm not going to prevent it. And because of that, you guys need to be warned. Bad behavior spreads. And we all know it. We've got enough stories of somebody with an alcoholic father that becomes an alcoholic. Somebody with an abusive mom that becomes an abusive person. It passes down. Now, how does it pass down? He's very clear on this. Of those who hate me. In other words, I, you know, if, if, if I'm an abusive drunk and I'm contaminating because of that rot, that iniquity, I'm contaminating my family, that could spread if my kids also hate God. See, those kids, I know plenty of kids who come from you know, abusive, alcoholic-type families But they went, I'm not going to hate God. I'm going to love God. And guess what? It breaks the chain. How many times? Every time. Every time. That's what God is saying here. He's just saying, look, this is not about me, you know, causing you to, to, to feel the guilt of somebody else's sins because Ezekiel 18, 20 says, that's not what God does. God never punishes someone for another, another person's sins. However, he will allow the consequences and those consequences can affect a lot of people. They can, and you need to be aware of that. That's why God is saying this is not about guilt or vengeance or even punishment, really. He's just saying it's a warning. God will allow the the consequences of human sin to spread out, and it can go two, three, four generations sometimes. So he's saying, you know, you can stop this. Here's how it works. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. But I show loving kindness to thousands of, of those who love me and keep my commandments. So what he's trying to say here is, look, if you choose to be love me, that free will choice, keep my commandments, my way of doing things, well, that's going to have an effect literally to thousands around you. Now, which one do you want? Let's think now. You want to see your iniquity and the rot in your life affect your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Or do you want to choose to love me Keep my commandments and watch the blessing extend to thousands. Which do you want? That's what he's saying here. You devote yourself to me. You don't worship idols. The result will be blessings to thousands. I'll give you one good example that many people in this room have felt themselves personally. One man, one man said, I think we need to take the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program and make it Christ-centered. One man made that decision, wrote it all out. 
There are now 34,000 Celebrate Recovery chapters in the world, including right here. 34,000. Now, guys, that's thousands of people. <laughs> because one man said, I'm going to be devoted. How about William Carey? One man said, I will be devoted. What will your devotion do? How far? How many thousands? It's the promise. See, there, there's a social lie out there. And, and it goes like this. It says that if you do things God's way, it's going to ruin your fun in life. And it's a social lie. All you got to do is look around you. I know some of you, you get, you get this temptation because all of your friends are going to the party where they're smoking dope and they're having a beer in one hand and, 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 and you're, they're sitting around and they're all hooking up and they're doing all these things and you're tempted because those are your friends. You're tempted because that's your social circle. I get it. But look closely. Look at their children. Look at the rot in their life affecting their kids already. And you've seen it. You're going, man, you're busy out partying and all you are is hung over all week. You abandon the kid. The kid's walking around. It stinks all the time. What's going on, man? Your relationships, you're, it's like a revolving door. It's empty. Becomes substance abuse, petty, emotional drama all the time. Destroying families. I am here to tell you, and God has promised that that kind of a lifestyle will affect the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. But you can make a different choice. God, it's, it's like, guys, it's like the difference. I mean, how many hungover days do you have to have before you figure out that you're drinking out of a muddy pond? But God is offering you absolute, clear, beautiful water that will fulfill you forever. And he's saying, you drink this and I will bless thousands through you. Amen. There's your choice. Now that's just the first two commandments. <laughs> I will continue. Amen. But here's the key on this one and we'll close with this. First two commandments are telling us that the positive effects of following the principles that we find in the laws of God and living by God's ways, that is going to be a thousand times better. A thousand times better than, any, than what any evil could do in your life or in your culture or in your family. That's the principle that's behind this. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, we've only covered the first two of the Ten Commandments. We're going we're gonna to keep going. We're going to go through this verse by verse, and we're going we're gonna to learn a lot. You're going to learn a lot about the Hebrew language here. <laughs> you're going to learn a lot about history. You're going to learn a lot about culture. We're going to be talking about ancient cultures and the Hammurabi Code, and you're going to get all kinds of archaeology. This is going to be fun. Lots of fun. So you've got to come back. How many of you got something today? How many of you learned something you didn't know? You got something feel a little better because I didn't understand that about all that jealousy thing. Now I feel better. How many of you know your God is jealous for you and it's a good thing? Okay, you learned something today. That's good. That's awesome. So you need to come back so that you can get more. In the meantime, let's pray. Holy Father, Lord and King, you are beginning. You are the end. You are first. You're the last. You have proven yourself through the miracle that this universe could not exist unless you do. We saw that last week. Just like the Hebrew people saw all those miracles in Egypt, we have seen all the miracles of the expanding universe and the laws of thermodynamics and all that. And just like you brought them out of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, so, Lord, we have seen you break the chains of addictions around us, give hope into the lives of so many. And just like the Hebrew people were given an offer, so this morning we freely choose again. You will be our God. We will be your people. We will have no other gods before you. If you agree with me on that, raise your hand. We will have no other gods before you.
Father God, look down at your people with their hands raised that say, we agree, we will have no other gods but you. We worship you. Lord, I pray that you encourage and build up your people. I pray that as we leave this room, we leave a different way than when we came in. We're going, my God is jealous for my good. My God wants to bless me so that my life blesses thousands. My God is so awesome. He has given me all kinds of evidence so that I can believe. I can say, praise the Lord. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise so, Father, that's what we think about this morning. We pray, Lord God, that you help us to feel that your face is turned towards us. That you got our back. You're going to guide our way. Thank you, Lord God, that we can know that you'll fill us with an everlasting love. We worship you in the quiet of this moment. We worship you. You alone. We will have no other God. This is what we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen.